Where did it all go wrong for Victoria? For the first time in a century, Victorians will be locked out of New South Wales to stop a second wave of COVID cases from spreading. These are uncertain times at home and around the world, and now our national defence strategy is shifting to prepare. There's lots to talk about tonight, including our drinking habits. You've got heaps of questions, so let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, television host, comedian and teetotaler, Sean McAuliffe, whose new documentary explores Australia's love affair with booze. The Shadow Minister for Environment and Water, Terry Butler, is here. Former Defence Minister Christopher Pine, who's just released his memoir after a 25-year career in politics. It is not called The Fixer, it's called The Insider. <laughs> and today's show entertainment reporter and Camilla Roy woman, Brooke Boney, is here as well. Please make them all feel welcome. It's great to have some more of you here too. And remember, you can stream us live on iView, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag. Please do join in the conversation. Our first question tonight comes from Mari Webb. Thanks, Hamish. My question is for the panel. I feel we are on our knife edge with COVID-19. We had the Ruby Princess debacle. Now Melbourne is doing it tough. Is it pure blind luck that my home state is fine while Melbourne is not? What can we learn from this? Terry Butler. It's, it's a terrifying time, isn't it, for a lot of people. And I know that people around the country have been following the events in Victoria and our hearts really go out yeah. to them. Um, I think what's really important is that we recognise that we're still in a pandemic that's got a long way to run before we know what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Christopher Pine, do you have a view as to what's gone wrong in Victoria? Well, I think they have a different process uh, to the other states. For example, in South Australia, at the hotel uh, quarantines, we have not just um, security guards, but also South Australian police force, uh, public health nurse, nurses, um, doctors from the Department of Health, public servants. I mean, it's a whole full court press. And my understanding, which could be uh, exaggerated, but my understanding is that in, in Victoria they've mainly been managed by the security firms. And the security guard firms have said that they've had very little training in terms of dealing with COVID. I think one of the reports was that they had a four minutes of training before they were sent into the front line, if you like. And I think that process has clearly been found wanting. But the criticism now with these housing blocks is that the response is too heavy-handed. I mean, doesn't this show that it's very difficult for the states to get it right, no matter what the circumstance? No, I don't think it's too heavy-handed. I think uh, the states and the nations that went hard early on uh, social distancing, the new term for staying away from each other, uh, have proven to have had the better outcomes. And... Um, I think Victoria was very much part of that until obviously very recently and I think the failures have come from the quarantining in hotels in Melbourne. That seems to be where the hot spots have leached from and uh, I mean Sweden is another example. A lot of people early in the COVID crisis, the pandemic, were saying, oh we should be doing what Sweden's doing. Um, they're not locking everything down, they've still got cafes, schools and so on going and people are making their own choices. And I said, yeah, well, that's, that's not what we're doing. And now we've been proven to be right because Sweden has the highest fatality rate in Europe uh, of uh, people who contract the pandemic, the, co the COVID virus. So, you know, I think going hard early has been a success for Australia. Uh, we're seeing what's really a second wave led by Victoria. I don't think, I agree with Terry, I don't think that'll be the end of it. I think, you know, other states are going to have similar problems down the track and no one wants to be too judgmental about it. We've been lucky and we've been well managed, but, you know, we're certainly not through it. Sean, you're a Victorian. Is yes. It, is it something that you actually feel uh, scared of? Um, what's coming? Well, we do, we do a show on the ABC called Mad as Hell and about halfway through this, the season, which was in about, was towards the end of March, we'd we lost our audience and uh, we, uh, we sort of continued on for another six episodes. 
and then had a break and uh, things were looking up and we were, we were assured that we would have our audience back and things would be back to normal. And, uh, and now uh, we're about a month away from coming back with Matters Helm. We don't have an audience again. We're in, we're in no better position than we were when we ended three to four months ago. And I think Christopher's probably right. Um, I suspect this is going to happen until or if there's a, uh, until there's a vaccine, yeah. assuming there is ever one. I, is there a sense in Victoria, though, with suburbs being effectively separated, with housing blocks being separated, that, that the community is actually being divided over this? Um, well, the um, Footscray area, and I think there are four tower blocks, maybe maybe two lots of four tower blocks in the Footscray area, which is not very far away from where, where I live. And I get, the, I get the sense anecdotally that everybody's actually chipping in and helping. So I get the other sense. I get the sense that communities aren't divided. In fact, they're coming together and being very supportive. Um, so part of me wants to always look for the positive that comes out of the COVID-19 crisis. And I think on a community level, things are pretty good. People are very willing to help each other. Okay. Yeah. We're seeing that through the volunteers for Food Bank as well and Fair Share, places like that that are actually getting together. There's just been a really big surge of people wanting to help. But do you think that people who are living in those apartment blocks think that the community's coming together when they can't leave their apartments or have anyone come in? I mean, I can't... I think it is heavy-handed. I can't imagine walking out of my house and having police standing there saying, oh, sorry, Brooke, not today, and um, also no-one's allowed to come and see you. Oh, it doesn't matter what you've got inside. We'll try to make sure that you've got the things that you need within the next 24 to 48 hours. And, you know, there's an apartment block across the road from them that looks like a similar volume of people with similar density. And I, I understand that from the figures there were 16 people out of the 127 who were diagnosed overnight. That's, that's a lot. And I think that, you know... Is it the best solution to have police there guarding or would it be more effective to maybe have translators or to have the COVID Safe app in different languages and explain to people from different language groups the best way to manage community transmission? Well, maybe those subtleties will come in, in time over the next five days because really those tower blocks are like giant docked cruise ships at the moment mm. and each of them have got about 5,000 people living in them. But how are they different from other tower blocks? Well, they're the ones, I think, where they've found that there's a, there's a higher level of infections. Mm. All right, our next question tonight is a video from Sue Key in Perth in Western Australia. This morning, a federal politician sparked a backlash as a result of comments made about the residents in the public housing estate in inner North Melbourne. What can be done immediately to quash and quell any negativity that has arisen as a result of these comments? And more particularly, what can be done to ensure that these residents are readily provided with access to daily necessities that are appropriate to their needs? So the politician she's referring to is Pauline Hanson. She appeared on the Today Show this morning. Uh, among the things she said was that uh, the fact is a lot of them, referring to the people in the tower blocks, are drug addicts as well. She said they're alcoholics. Uh, a lot of these people are from non-English speaking backgrounds, probably English isn't their second language, who haven't adhered uh, to the rules of social distancing. Brooke, uh, how did you feel watching that go out on your program today? I felt completely heartbroken. I grew up in Housing Commission and to me I was thinking about all of those kids sitting at home watching or all of those people trapped in their apartments watching and thinking this is what Australia thinks of us, this is what the rest of our country thinks, is that we're alcoholics and drug addicts. And that's disgusting. And I'm all for free speech and I think that, you know, people, um, when they have different perspectives and, and different um, opinions, that it, most of the time it does help drive argument forward or, you know, debate forward or policy forward. But when you use it to, to vilify people or to be deliberately um, mean and, and mean-spirited, it's... That, that, to me, is disgusting. But I suppose it's not surprising that Pauline Hanson said some of those things. She's got a long record of saying things that provoke outrage uh, and some would argue promote division. She's been on your program and other breakfast programs for, for a very long time. Why get rid of her now? The Today Show said that she's no longer coming back. 
I think there is a very big difference between saying things that you really truly believe and are helpful and and representing your electorate. And let's not forget that she's elected. And if you go and have a look at some of the comments that are around on the internet, there are a lot of people who support Pauline Hanson. And those perspectives, you know, they, they should be heard. I mean, I don't agree with a lot of them and, and they certainly don't match up with my values, but that doesn't mean that their perspectives are worth any less than mine and that they shouldn't be heard on platforms like the Today Show or Q&A or whatever. But when they cross over to being mean and, and uh, causing division and... Uh, vilifying a whole group of people, I think that's a whole other story. And I think that that's where we draw the line. I think that's a bit of a cop-out. I mean, she's been a public racist since 1996. She used her first maiden speech to say that we were in danger of being swamped by Asians. And she used her second maiden speech to say that we were in danger of being swamped by Muslims. I mean, we're talking about someone here who didn't just wake up this morning and for the first time ever say something racist. And shows have been platforming her. And, you know, free speech is one thing. Elevating racism in the, in the discourse is another, and I think what we need and what Labor's been calling for for a long time is an anti-racism campaign, a national anti-racism campaign to try to deal with some of the things that we're hearing at the moment, particularly during the COVID pandemic. It's pretty clear what we need. Today's show is not the only um, show that has Pauline Hanson right. uh, mm. on it regularly. Sunrise had for a long time. Mm, quite so right. it's, uh, I mean, it's but obviously... But and I think she was that ratings. But that relationship fell apart over uh, the Christchurch attacks and an right. altercation between the host and Pauline Hanson then, and that regular spot was resumed pretty promptly on the Today the program. Show, I mean, yeah. do these programs, do you think, uh, just place the ratings over productive public conversation? Uh, well, I think they do. But, but ratings is very much the preeminent um, priority of those kinds of shows, or most commercial television, because they want to sell advertising. So is Pauline this... Hanson does very well for ratings, because she'll say... Uh, these kinds of totally inappropriate things, racially profiling people in public housing is absolutely disgraceful and such a thing of the past. I mean, it kind of reminds you of Oswald Mosley from the 1930s. It's sort of bizarre. But it's... Uh, but he wouldn't do it on television. He wouldn't well, do he it on television. Well, he wouldn't have had the chance. He wouldn't have had the chance. But I'm curious. I mean, I, I appreciate you might not be privy there in the moment, but when Senator Hanson gets up and speaks in the Senate, is there much difference in what she says compared with what she says on, on the television? I don't know. I haven't listened to one of her speeches in the Senate, nor read them. I, is, it, is, it any, is it any more nuanced in the Senate? So, uh, well, neither... I Christopher wasn't in the Senate, and I, I'm not in the Senate, but I can... Mm. You know, you see the sorts of things that she does to get attention, like wearing a burqa into the mm. chamber yeah. to try to provoke division amongst the Australian community. Does she see herself, do you think, as a delegate for the people that she represents, rather than a... Rather I think than it's a, a business model. I think it's all about her, fr frankly. I think it's about uh, she's got a party built on a brand. The brand is built on her personality. Her business model has worked. No, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, Pauline Hanson genuinely believes the things that she says and she's been quite consistent about it. Mm. Consistently bad, right? But she's been <laughs> consistent about it. But it can be both, Christopher. As you pointed out. It can be both. 96 to the second one. Could be both, depends on the people around her. But it, I, I, yeah, it I, depends on what you're using it for. I've been surprised watching Pauline Hanson over 20 odd years that her views haven't changed very much. And to go to your point, Sean, there's definitely a cadre of people who believe and agree with what Pauline says. Mm. And they've been the one party from the non Labor side of politics that has been actually quite electorally successful in the last 20 years, One Nation. But as a politician, she has to be more than just. Um, a voice for the people she represents. Well, of course, but she, she has to... Takes all kinds. And it's down to the voters, to be honest, Sean, isn't it? I mean, Sorry? who puts her in the parliament, the people who vote for her? It's, it's not just about one woman, it's about what, what a, a big slice of the community And they'd be listening thinks. to this conversation tonight saying, that's exactly why we vote for Pauline Hanson, yeah, exactly. because of those kinds of people Go and have like a look at the who comments sort of on the say internet. that they're not... They, they support yeah. her. This isn't, you know, they she do. hasn't put herself there. No. These people elected her. They believe what she believes. Quite and, easily elected her, by and, the way. Uh, exactly. like she got two and quotas um, the year that she got elected. There may be, you know, a certain portion who were led along by her, but a lot of them wholeheartedly believe what she believes. Can, can, can we be totally. clear about this, though? Are you happy to see her gone, dumped from your I program? am so happy to see her gone. Um, you know, she says awful things about Aboriginal people as well that really upset me. And, you know, it's not about me being upset. It's, it's about... 
uh, someone intentionally being divisive. And they're ill-informed. They're just not true, the things that she says. And, and that's what's really upsetting because as a journalist, you you know, you sort of um, try your very best to, to make sure that what you say is, is factual. And, and, you know, even when you do give your opinion, you don't say things that aren't true. All right, our next question is from Sarah Mansour in the studio. Thanks, Hamish. Um, I'm an Australian of Egyptian uh, background and I've personally been subject to the application of stereotypes based on my colour and my surname. So assumptions have been made about my place of birth, my nationality and my beliefs before I even open my mouth. And I don't appreciate those types of assumptions being made. However, I do appreciate a good parody every now and then. Um, and the first, although, I mean, I'm not suggesting that we should be publicising offensive content, but the first question I have for the panel is, um, where do we draw the line between what is healthy and uh, comical parody and what is offensive um, and unhealthy? And my second question is, if we do start to over-censor things like shows on Netflix, are we actually going to add more to the problem by further making invisible the fact that these stereotypes do exist? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I guess because it's not available on Netflix doesn't necessarily mean it's censored, because I suppose you can get these shows, you just have to look a bit harder for them. Um, but it uh, helps every now and again to have a bit of an audit of your inventory, I think, um, whether it be Netflix or perhaps even the ABC. I know the ABC, in response to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, have decided to have a look at its back catalogue and make sure that whatever's available on iView um, uh, has, uh, has a sense that somebody's looked at it and, and uh, applied some sort of sensitivity to the selection. We're obviously talking about cancel culture. A number of individuals have been targeted and, and cancelled, as it were. As a comedian that's been working for decades, do, do you look back and, and think through what you've done and, and ask yourself, have I done things that are no longer acceptable? Uh, yeah, yeah, I certainly... Uh, when the, when the Me Too movement uh, started to uh, gain some traction, I, I think a lot of people uh, did an audit and had a look at themselves professionally and privately, and uh, certainly with, uh, with the Black, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, I've wondered about that myself because, because obviously a lot of comedy shows have come up for a bit of a hit, and I certainly remember um, John Cleese talking about um, Forty Towers uh, with the... Uh, the Germans episode and there was a racial slur used by a character in that particular episode. And uh, he pointed out um, that uh, the BBC had, I think as recently as the early 90s, decided to snip that particular reference anyway with, with his consent and approval. And indeed when um, Cleese came over here to Australia to launch the stage version of Faulty Towers in which the Germans episode featured, he decided to remove it. So I think I think as long as the creator's involved, I think it's a good idea to revisit things, particularly if they're still popular. Um, I know that if... Uh, well, Mad as Hell's been running nine, ten years now, and I think if the ABC decided to make it all available on iView, I would welcome the opportunity to sit down with the ABC and maybe just look at things and see how they land now and stuff that's even older, more so. So I think it's a healthy thing. Christopher Pine, how do you feel about cancelling artistic pursuits from the past or even recent uh, expressions of art or even statues? Well, I think you've got to be... Uh, ..have some common sense about it. And uh, I think that um, there was an example recently of uh, Gone with the Wind being um, edited or cancelled because of the character of uh, Mammy, who was the um, slave. But you can't actually make a movie about the Civil War uh, in the United States without having black slaves in it. It doesn't actually mean that you are parroting black people as slaves. It means you, it's, a, it's a proper historic record of what happened. I think it was the way she was portrayed, though. Mm. I think well, the that way she was portrayed... Patty sure. McDonald's performance. But that becomes very granular, then. You start to say, I don't like the way she was portrayed. But there was also a whole movement to cancel Gone with the Wind. But I think that's different. And I would not cancel Gone with the Wind because I don't think you can make a Civil War movie without black slaves. On the other hand... I think the blackface of some of the comedies that have been taken off by the ABC... Um, You're talking about Chris Lilly? Yes, I think that's the right thing to do because that's modern and it's mm. completely unnecessary and it's clearly uh, 
racially profiling black people in an inappropriate way and we should know better than that. But, but then you've written arguing that a statue of the former South Australian Charles Premier, Cameron Charles Kingston. Kingston, should remain? Of course. Even though he was a very vocal supporter of the white Australia Well, policy. everyone was in the 1890s, mm. including most of the leaders of the trade union movement. So, so are you making a judgement call then about what you think is acceptable forms no, of my racism? Column, my column said that... Uh, Let's be, let's be sensible about this argument. I don't think we should have a statue of a slave trader in Bristol on display. But Charles Cameron Kingston was the Premier who brought in votes for women in 1894 and allowed women to stand for Parliament for the first Parliament in the world in South Australia. He led industrial relations reform that supported the rights of workers. He was no right-wing racist. Now, most people in the 1890s were in favour of the white Australia policy. Some, state, some are still in favour of the white Australia policy, sadly, but um, he was no different to all politicians of the time, and that is not a reason to remove his statue, whereas I don't think we should have a statue of a slave trader, and I don't think we should have a ranger called King Leopold Rangers. Well, I you think do, it's all... I think you it's, just it's, said he was no right-wing racist. Can you be certain that he wasn't a racist, given that he was a... Well, he could have been a racist, but I meant in the current way that we think of racists being right-wing some of the people in the British uh, uh, UKIP party, etc., some of the things that they've said. He wasn't that kind of person. His values of being in favour of the white Australia policy... I mean, Alfred Deakin was in favour of the white Australia policy, and the left hold him up as a great doyen of uh, interference from government in the economy. And he was a Liberal, of course, so I support him very strongly. But uh, So you, you have to actually make a sensible... Uh, historical call. You can't just say anybody was in favour of the wise trader policy, let's remove their statues. Oop. But it's different Oop. if they're uh, obviously a slave trader in Bristol is a different story. I um, thank you for your question, Sarah. And, you know, I think all of this cancel culture stuff is... It's happening at a really, really difficult time for all of us. There's so many massive questions. Um, I think what they ended up doing with Gone with the Wind was um, making a little film at the start of it that they showed to provide context right. and um, then they put it back up. So it was right. um, originally cancelled by HBO sensible. Max. That's sensible. Mm. Could, you do that with, could you do that with a statue? You put another plaque on well, the back Well, yeah, this is song? what I think. I actually think you could you do that. Well, we could, um, yeah. Because I think that the problem that I have with statues... I mean, not that I walk around Hyde Park and am offended by statues that I see. I think it's a massive distraction, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I think what would be more helpful to people and to Aboriginal people is to have a more complete version of history available. And, you know, if we are going to walk around and see statues, then we'll say, you know, this person meant this at the time and this was the context well, that I they agree existed with that in. Completely. But, you know, this is the impact that those sorts of views had on women or on Aboriginal people or, or on whoever at the time. And, you know, maybe if we are going to have weird statues around the place, we could put up some statues of other heroes like Barangaroo or Benelong. I mean, or Benelong. Pemelwe. Or Pemelwe. Uh, Benelong was the first Aboriginal man to speak English. Um, that's an incredible achievement. Like, what an amazing intellect that man must have had. And I think that a lot of people would go, oh, Benelong, that's where the Opera House is, or that's some lovely restaurant or whatever. Like, they wouldn't actually know who Benelong is. And if we are going to have these statues, then it's important that we... Um, tell a more complete story of our history. I agree. Yeah. But I also think that this debate is incredibly frustrating because it's happening at a time when we're talking about young people dying, um, black people dying. And, you know, the other day I woke up from a nap um, and I saw on Twitter that Ken Wyatt and the Prime Minister were um, talking about having an Indigenous incarceration close the gap target. Um, of 2093 and I thought how long have I been napping for like, <laughs> what is going on here this is ridiculous and so you know I'm not offended by statues I'm 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 a little bit offended by some tv shows but I don't really care I'm not offended by you know redskins or chicos I mean obviously I would prefer if they weren't there it's obviously awful to walk into the supermarket and see um like a racial slur written on some cheese and um but I would much rather that we're talking about things that actually make a difference in the lives of, of Aboriginal people, things like early childhood education rates, things like, the, uh, you know, incarceration rates, things like uh, justice reinvestment that are actually helpful and not just virtue signalling. There are individuals, though, sometimes in these cases that are impacted and we've been contacted by uh, Felipe Mahi and his wife, Felipe was the individual that is alleged to be the, the inspiration for the Chris Lilly character, mm. Jonah from Tonga. Uh, they've written a question because they're so, they've received so much backlash 
in recent weeks over this that they don't feel comfortable to show their faces on the program tonight. Um, but the question is, my husband, Felipe, uh, had the character Jonah from Tonga based on him when he was at his most vulnerable. He's felt exploited for years. Why is it that most Australians feel he should get over it? And how does Chris Lilly and the ABC get away with this without an apology or explanation? Well, this is what I think the big difference is. When you were talking about John Cleese talking about Faulty Towers and saying that was of a time and place, and I regret it, edit it out. I don't care. Chris Lilly, that same week when we took all of those programs off air, you know, people can still probably find them in the nether regions of the internet if they want to, but he released a, an unedited clip or some extra part of Jonah from Tonga, even though this man had said, this really upsets me, I've lost a parent, I've got dyslexia and I used my culture to try to get through those periods, which were incredibly tough, and you've exploited that for comedy. He goes and does that. What, like, what, what was in the clip? Uh, it was just a, a, another clip for, from Jonah from Tonga or... Um, that, that wasn't uh, in the That wasn't part version. of the it hadn't show. hadn't been published. But he, he shared it on his personal YouTube oh. channel. He hasn't come out and said, I'm sorry. He hasn't come out and said, this is a learning moment for me. And so what, I think What about disgusting. the ABC, though? Should the ABC apologise? To Felipe? Um, I think that the producer who worked on it said that she felt really awful at the time. Um, I, I, I don't want to tell the ABC what they should and shouldn't do. Sean McAuliffe, is there some responsibility here? You said you would welcome the opportunity uh, to go back through your material. Should the ABC be publicly reflecting on this? Well, I can't speak for the ABC and I can't speak for Chris either, I suppose, but I can speak for, for myself. And, uh, <laughs> look, if it, was for, if, it, if it was up to me, um, uh, I would be ringing up and knocking on the door at the ABC and saying I'd like to participate in dealing with the reaction to this situation. I can't remember when Chris's show was on air. Is it, was it, um... It's quite it hasn't been on air for a few years now. Yeah. Was it as long ago as 2005, 2006? Yeah, I guess so, probably. Yeah. But it surprises right. me that that, that show... 07, had that about kind 07, of, I think. 07. Yeah. It had that kind of uh, humour in the noughties and the mm. 2000s. I mean, it's a bit yeah, unusual. It's quite. I mean, I can, I can imagine how in the 60s they made shows like mm. that, that were racist about in Britain about people living next yes. door to each Love other. Love Thy Neighbour, I think. Love Thy Neighbour. I was going to say that, but I thought I might have got it wrong. But in the 2000s, I always thought that... I mean, I never really watched the show because it wasn't a humour that I enjoyed, but it did surprise me. All right. Our next question tonight is from Jasmine Pulakakos. Thank you. I'm a Year 12 student currently undertaking a research project for my society and culture major work around the role of alcohol consumption in shaping Australia's national identity. What role do you think the advertisement of alcohol in sports such as NRL or AFL has in facilitating the acceptance of alcohol consumption as a part of our national identity? And should there be restrictions imposed on this type of advertising like those existing for smoking? Sure. Well... That's a, um, that's a very good question and inherent in that question is the answer. I think, yeah, I think, I think yes, I think that's the way, that's going to be the way it goes, I think. You've been on a big journey across Australia, effectively investigating for a new documentary, uh, Australia's relationship with booze. Yeah, because I had no idea. I mean, I... Uh, Explain why. Well, I... I uh, my parents didn't drink and I didn't have my first drink until I turned 18 and... Uh, and went to university and, uh, and uh, felt that drinking just uh, meant that you had to get drunk, otherwise there was no point to it. <laughs> so, and I wasn't very good at it, you know, I'd take <laughs> three glasses of something and, uh, you know, I, I was obviously very amusing and charming, uh, <laughs> or so I thought. <laughs> uh, I was quickly disabused of that notion by my friends, so I, I gave up and, uh, and uh, uh, didn't really think about it at all, apart from that idea of just giving it up. There was a particular moment, though, that led you to give up, wasn't there? Yeah, well, yeah, yes, there was. Yes, there was. And uh, uh, it was a, a cause of great embarrassment to me. It was after work and I'd, uh, I'd had too much to drink, way too much to drink. Uh, and I, I wasn't a charming drunk at all. I was just a, a drunk. And I was asleep and, uh, and my, uh, uh, my then fiance and her mother and their poodle uh, came to uh, <laughs> came to find me in that state, and I was so ashamed that I that that, that was what prompted me just to give it up. Uh, now, no, I'm 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 not suggesting for a moment it was a great struggle for me to give up, and I know that a lot of people who who have struggles with alcohol and they're far more deserving of uh, some applause than, than than me just giving up. But 
fast forward uh, 25 years and my children are approaching the age where they're going to be offered alcohol and uh, I had really had no advice for them. So I thought, why is it a thing? Why do people drink at all? It seems like a, it seems like a strange foreign country to me. So I, I decided to, um, rather than uh, give my children advice, I would, uh, I would actually go around and make a documentary and make them watch it. Uh, <laughs> and and you, you went to, of all places, a BNS ball. Uh, let's take a look. Everywhere I look, BNS ball virgins who aren't me are undergoing various induction rituals, which principally involve downing as much alcohol from as many receptacles as possible in the shortest space of time. You want to do one? No, no, I, I couldn't really. Thank you, though. How many standard drinks would that be, I wonder? About 1.1, 1.2. In a shoe? Whoop, whoop, yeah. whoop. At a BNS, everyone looks after their mates. If my mate was drinking and he was throwing up, mate, I'd put him to bed. Remember those days when we could get together in a group and uh, enjoy ourselves, apparently? Um, but I, I, I wonder whether uh, alcohol may go the way of, uh, of tobacco in terms of, uh, you know, pictures of cirrhosed livers on labels and things like that, because one of the big takeaways for me as a result of making this documentary, and I wasn't aware of it, uh, maybe I was naive, was, is that alcohol is a class one carcinogen, and uh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, it's... it's pretty dangerous. Uh, Terry, it's not just the sporting codes, it's governments as well that rely on dollars flowing in from the alcohol companies. Uh, do you think we need to have a, a look at the, the structures around this, the, the things that are leading so many of us to drink to excess? Well, it's something that the Australian Institute of Health and um, uh, Wellbeing and uh, Welfare has looked at and particularly recently given the COVID uh, lockdown, isolation, social distancing that everyone's been through, the there's some evidence that there has been a spike in alcohol use and that's not really surprising when you look at what are the risk factors for people to drink more. For women, it's people who... For women, it's having childcare responsibilities. For men, it's the loss of a job. And for everyone, it's stress. And that pretty much describes the most recent several months we've just been through. So it's not surprising that there has been an increase in drinking in some households. The Conservative estimates say about 20% of, of households have had more alcohol use. So I think that there is right now in the context of the COVID uh, recovery, hopefully there'll be a COVID recovery uh, pretty soon. We all have talked already tonight about how difficult it is to look into a crystal ball and see what happens with COVID. But in the context of coming out of it, I think we do need to think about what that has meant for us, the additional reliance on alcohol through that period, but come to grips more broadly with our drinking culture that we have. And I'm looking forward to seeing the documentary to see a bit more Politics about it. is pretty boozy though, isn't it, Christopher Pike? Yes, it is. Um, and I'm not a teetotaler, uh, nor am I a wowser, uh, <laughs> and I actually enjoy alcohol, and, uh, but I enjoy it with meals. I enjoy it with eating, and I think it... it really book launches, I know your, your book launch event in Canberra is called Wine with Wine Pine. Wine with Pine. A mixer the, with the fixer. For the Insider. <laughs> uh, on Tuesday night, tomorrow night, Annabelle Crabbe and I are launching the Insider in Canberra, that's correct, uh, with Canberra Writers' Festival. So I think alcohol should be enjoyed. I think it should be enjoyed with meals and restaurants and cafes. And uh, are we too dependent on it? I though, think the problem with alcohol is when you, you know, drink it to uh, ridiculous excess. Mm. I haven't seen any statistics that suggest that alcoholism is worse in Australia um, more recently than the last, you know, several decades. We are a high alcohol consumption country. I think Germany is higher. Uh, and obviously you'll find, if you travel into things like B&Ss, you're mm. going to find a lot of people uh, drinking totally inappropriately. Well, per head since the 70s, it's gone down. But is oddly it? enough, uh, uh, per head for women, it's gone up. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And during COVID, I think 26% of Australians said they've upped their intake by more than five drinks a week, which is a pretty significant amount. I wonder if it, was, if it wasn't as accessible, because you can obviously get your boxes delivered now and there's no human interaction, whereas maybe as recently as five or six years ago, you would actually have to pop down to the shop and mm. physically present yourself. And I think just... people were busier before COVID. Like, you know, if I was at work and I'm driving home at five o'clock and I get home at six o'clock or whatever it might be, then you're not drinking until six, six thirty, seven o'clock. Mm. Being at home for COVID, my wife and I would have a drink late in the afternoon at 5.30 or five o'clock or six o'clock when mm. we wouldn't normally have ever done that before. Mm. What would you have? Gin and tonic. Gin and tonic. With lemon and lime. Yeah. <laughs> so, which is my favourite drink. But a lot of women are drinking wine to get through it. People who've got mm. kids, you know, they've been homeschooling, so the kids have been at home. They've been trying to work out how to do that. 
they've had the stress of whether the household income is going to drop or it already has dropped for a lot sure. of people. I think so you're right about the time, the time getting a bit muddy too because, you know, there, there are times when, is, is today Saturday? Is today yeah. Thursday? And I don't just think you should be so judgy about it. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, I don't think that we'll end up uh, with alcohol being treated the way, same way as cigarettes and tobacco because well, you can't have... Because you can have one or two glasses of wine and not actually damage your health. Well, but you can't smoke without damaging your health. So, well, when we but I think that's the evidence for alcohol now, isn't it? That there's no real benefit to drinking, that it is only... Well, if you, it is if you like drinking a glass of white wine with your meal, well, with your schnitzel. The, um, Shardy with some ice. There's some new guidelines coming out. Yeah. Very stressful. I, there are some a glass of red with though. a steak. I mean, I do. I'm so sorry about it. It's <laughs> but fine. No one's being judgy, but the, um, there are new guidelines I'm that are due to come out. I'm going to go out and wear a hair shirt them. after tonight now that I know how wicked I've been. When we were enjoying a glass of red wine. When we were talking about COVID and, and how stressful it is. I think when it started, I was thinking, like, I'm going to do yoga every day, I'm going to go for a walk, I'm going to be I so I lost seven kilos hot. during COVID. Yeah, but then you get to week three and you're so bored and it's five o'clock, so you just go to the fridge and... Do you know have what I did the first oh, month? I looked like a Teletubby after the first yeah. month because I kept going to the kitchen yeah. and constantly eating. Yes. Right? Yeah. And if I put a onesie on, I would have looked like one of those Teletubbies. So yeah. I thought, this has got to stop. What do you so mean? What do you mean, what do you mean, so what do you mean when... if you put a onesie on? <laughs> Terry, Terry's point. Terry's point is interesting because we, when we were making the documentary, there was some debate about uh, uh, the uh, uh, silhouette of the pregnant woman on the back of a wine mm. bottle, mm. and I think that that exists now. But there was some question as to whether there should be text, mm. and the alcohol industry was reluctant to to agree to the text, saying warning. Uh, but I any, think there any, should be mm. for pregnant women any, a text. A, a, a warning. Definitely. Yes, that's right. But I think that I think the worry was that the text would take up more of the label, and obviously the label is a very very important thing on a wine bottle because it it evokes a <laughs> and unborn mood children of, aren't. What's yeah. that? And unborn children aren't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so, so I'm yeah. not sure what the result of that particular well, to and um, fro was. I don't know what the outcome of the labelling issue is, but the the general question of what is safe drinking is actually. Um, under investigation at the moment, the, the National Health and Medical Research Council, um, which you're well aware of, of course, uh, had some guidelines put out for, for consultation and they're expected to be finalised. So what we actually need, I think, right now is for the current government to crack the whip on that and, and make sure that people do have the most up-to-date information, particularly when I think it's pretty clear that drinking has become a bit well, more prevalent. And it's not judgy. It's not I, about I was the, how uh, dare you have a drink wagging your mm, finger. I was the Prime Minister Secretary for Health with responsibility for alcohol, drugs and tobacco. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I was quite across this alcohol issue when they put the pregnant women picture on the labels. In fact, I put the worn, the hideous photographs on cigarette packets, right? So I think people should have as much information as possible about what they're doing, and obviously we want to discourage everybody from problem drinking, no, clearly. But I also don't think we want to start a campaign against alcohol as though it's somehow inherently evil. Mm -hmm. But for pregnant women... It's obviously something they shouldn't be encouraged to be drinking alcohol. I mean, there should be proper warnings on the bottle. And there should be an education campaign. There should be an education A lot of the people campaign. I spoke to when making the documentary uh, didn't know of the link between uh, breast cancer and, uh, and, and, and drinking. And remember in, uh, I mean, in the 50s and 60s and 70s when we were young... Yeah. Um, <laughs> We went to no, I should we inform went to everybody that they went to the same university <laughs> and, and there was overlap, I believe. There was, there was by here, that's right. But women used to smoke while they were pregnant without even thinking twice about it. Without even thinking twice about it. And look, happily, we've now managed to get education to the point where I don't think you hardly ever see pregnant women smoking. But there but is... In our ah, youth, they were smoking like trains. There is a big difference, though, because uh, smoking cigarettes, I mean, you might get addicted to nicotine, but you... Not each succeeding cigarette doesn't muddy your brain in the way that alcohol does. I mean, you might no, but it's promise... it's not very good for your fetus. You, well, it's not very good for your fetus, but you might promise yourself, I'll only have three drinks, but each succeeding drink makes that promise less likely. You're less likely to stick to it. It, it, it kind of mm. takes away your reason a little bit, unlike tobacco. Mm. Yeah. So it has to be, you have to approach it a bit differently, don't you? We're going to move on, because oh. lots of people are telling us on Twitter that they're doing Dry July and would like us to discuss something else. So our next question is from <laughs> Meredith Williams. Oh, we're making them thirsty, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I like October. We're driving them all to the dream. <laughs> Everyone feels like a shoey. Meredith Williams is in the studio audience. My question is for Sean. Now that Matthias Cormann has announced he will leave Parliament before the end of the year, what will become of Darius Horsham? And do you think he may stay on as a spokesborg for the next finance minister? 
We are, of course, talking about one of the characters from Mad as Hell. So it's not a real person. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely question, Meredith. I'm, uh, well, I'm, ho I'm hopeful. In fact, Christopher, you might be able to... That, that is uh, Darius Horsham. As you can see, he bears no relationship at all to, uh, to Senator Cormann, although uh, a good friend of yours, Christopher, and I'm wondering what... Uh, Matthias oh, Matthias. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say there's a good friend of mine. I thought, there's another one? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if uh, there's no reason why Darius can't hang around, I think, as a, as a political commentator, even though... Uh, even though uh, Senator Cormann uh, always claimed never to be a commentator. Do you but still I... have that small statue of me on your... No, it's not you. Oh, I've told you this before. We do Christopher know Pine it. is under the impression that the, uh, pict the, 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 wobble, the bobble head of Scott Morrison that's on my desk on Mad as Hell is him. A lot of people think it's me. I d well, I don't know if a lot of people... <laughs> I think it's just you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're projecting. You are represented in the show. Have you ever seen a the show? No, I've actually never watched your show, but lots of people have told me why <laughs> does... <laughs> Why does she, why do I watch a lot of television? So now that I've retired from well, politics, you know I keep laughing at ads you. on the television during MasterChef. I didn't know there'd been 14 series of MasterChef. <laughs> and I'm watching, I'm completely obsessed with it. And I watch these ads and I burst out laughing and the children say, what's so funny? I say, that ad's hilarious. I say, yeah, that ad's been on television for five years. I say, no. That's <laughs> so clever. Well, how, why did you think that you had a wobble head on the desk if you've never watched <laughs> because it? Because friends of mine and yours, mutual friends, have sent me texts saying, why does Sean have that... It's effigy of you on his <laughs> just taunting panel. You. Anyway, it's I think taunting me. I think I think like, like Christopher. I think there's no reason why uh, uh, Christopher's avatar on the show and, uh, and <laughs> Matthias Cormann's avatar on the show can't continue. I okay. think. And it was also very nice of uh, Senator Cormann to wait until uh, uh, mid October. I think, or maybe the first week of October, which is when we finish, so we can Give still... Give you next season a yeah, run. Yeah, in fact, I'm hopeful that he can come on and say goodbye to Darius. You, you do <laughs> write a fair bit about Matthias Cormann and his role in the downfall of Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, do you think, ultimately, that that was the end of the game for Matthias Cormann in politics? It's a good question. So, Matthias and I are very good friends, uh, despite the fact that Matthias is much more conservative than I am, but that's all right uh, in politics and that's what it's like. Uh, and I do write a lot about Matthias in the book, mm. The Insider, uh, because... You've got your plug in, <laughs> OK. I have to. I have, the publishers told me I have to mention it as often as I can. <laughs> well, you're done. You've done. <laughs> what's, it, what's it called again? The Insider. <laughs> no more. <laughs> Published by Hachette, Australia. <laughs> and uh, because he was the reason about my theory about the solar system, because I des described it to him at the Commonwealth Club, and that, you know, that the sun is the leader and that the um, people orbit around the leader and that, that the week Peter Dutton came out of his orbit and kind of knocked all the planets about a bit, mm. and that Matthias and I were quite happy because we kind of knew where we were in the solar system. Where were you? I was um, one of the planets orbiting around the sun, the sun being Malcolm, of course. And by the time Malcolm was the leader, I was Mercury as opposed to Pluto, which I had been in the Howard government. <laughs> um, so you can move closer to the sun. And, um, but I do think that was a very traumatic week for a lot of people. Julie Bishop, Malcolm, me, Matthias, because Matthias is an inherently very loyal person. You, you have this story, though, about you and Matthias trying to get a hold of each other. We did on the during Wednesday. That week. We spent a lot of time trying to do that, and we didn't, which was very surprising. Because I was trying to find out whether he had changed his mind about Malcolm and he was trying to tell me that I should change my mind about so Malcolm. As were you avoiding out. each other, actually? No, we were just texting. It was a very... When you've gone through one of these, and Terry's been through a few in the Labor I Party, and when you've been through a couple in the Liberal Party, you sort of... It, it's a very fast-moving game. What if, you'd, what if you'd spoken to him, do you think? Do you think the outcome would have been different? I don't know, actually. It's, it's a question I pose in the book. The Insider. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Listen, you'll be marched off here in a second. Getting and say that beyond name again. hell, Christopher. That's the whole idea. But I feel like it, she wants to have a go I'm of saying say his documentary reading, name now. It is slightly implausible that given the stakes and given the central role that both of you were playing at that time... That we couldn't get hold of each other. That you couldn't get hold of each other. I know, but it's true, because I was actually... I, I, I missed him several times on the phone, texting, WhatsApp. <coughs> um... I am very firmly of the view that Ma Matthias believed that he was acting in the best interests of the Liberal Party, that he believed that Malcolm couldn't win the next election, and he made an assessment that Peter Dutton would, which I think was wrong, and that's why I didn't support uh, Peter Dutton. I supported Scott Morrison, and the rest, of course, is history. But I think he's an inherently loyal person and a very good finance minister. I think he'll be a real loss uh, to the Liberal Party uh, in government, but... You know, um, everyone has the right to choose when they want to leave, and uh, I did, and he did, and good luck to him. All right. The next question tonight is from Natasha Balderston. Thank you, Hamish. 
It seems like ministers in each political party are fully supportive of their party and its decisions while being a minister, but have quite salacious things to say once they're no longer <laughs> in the position. Do you think it's fair to the Australian public to be manipulated and lied to for the benefit of the party? And if so, what is the purpose of detailing the truth when politicians leave their position? Terry Butler. Well, I mean, I wrote a book while I was still in the parliament and... Uh, I'm sure you're saving your best stuff until later. <laughs> and I... Um, when it, I did what's that... What's it called, Terry? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be a Christopher Pine. Um, yeah. But uh, the... That was a um, big chance. The, I guess the... For me, the idea is to try to be as open about politics as possible and I'm really quite interested in demystifying politics for people because I think one of the great... Po the really big problems that we have right now is a lack of trust in politics and democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. And so sort of speaking out of both sides of your mouth or being a bit two-faced, that really undermines people's confidence in our democracy, which undermines people's confidence in really everything. That's the bedrock, right? So I really think it's important that we try to be as open about politics as possible and as transparent as we can be. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I want to see a National Integrity Commission established. It's one of the reasons why I think we need a Prime Minister that will actually uphold ministerial standards. All of those things are about starting to restore confidence uh, in democracy. So you won't see from me after politics a different version of politics than you saw from me during it. And I think that um, it's a good approach to take. What happens, though, when you are asked to say something or, or hold a line, carry a line, deliver a line? It's not really what you believe. Well, I've got to say, I mean, I find that um, through my time in politics, and the reason I said, Christopher, that I hadn't been through any leadership challenges like the ones you have is because, of course, I you came in after Kevin. Kevin. Of course, yes. you did. You took his seat. I did. Well, I didn't take his no, seat. I no. stood for a by-election yeah. after he left the parliament. Uh, and so my time there has been a, really a great time to be part of the Labor Party. And... I'm in the party because my values really align. And, of course, it's a mass movement. There's thousands of people in the Labor Party. The views and positions that we take are an aggregation of, of so many different perspectives and views and opinions. We're not... Like, if you're after a kind of a homogenous echo chamber, that's not the Labor Party. So, yes, there is definitely times where we are um, coming to positions that we've reached through really big democratic processes involving thousands of people. And part of being part of a caucus is you... But, but your example, case, you, you advocate you, you, and then you accept the views of the majority. Is it easy for you to go out and say everything you think and believe about the problems with the factional system and branch stacking and all of those terrible things that go on in your party? Well, I absolutely think it is and I have done that. You know, I've talked about the factional system, again, in my book, which I won't plug. Um, but, I really uh, want to know the name of it now. I don't want to know the name of, it. Like know the name of any more books tonight, please. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I think it is important to talk about that but also to debunk some of the mythology, you know, like... Take, for example, branch stacking. In my state, Queensland, we rooted that out in the late 90s, early 2000s, and I was a big part of that. That was, you know, I was a bit younger at the time, but one of the things that really galvanised me to be in the Labor Party was wanting to clean it up. And we had, you know, quite a similar situation to what Victoria's going through now. And what you saw is that when you cleaned it up, when you made the party work well, when it became more democratic, what happened? Well, Peter Beattie was returned in a landslide. So, yes, of course, in any big mass movement, there'll be problems, but like with anything, any problem, the real measure of someone is how you respond to it, not hoping that it wasn't there in the first place. Can I ask you something then? So when something like that happens, and Christopher, you can probably answer this as well, that does undermine, undermine the trust that the general public has in people in your profession, like, what do you say to your colleagues, to your mates who, you know, perhaps are doing it or perhaps are mates with the people who are doing it? Well, I think like anything... I mean, I was a lawyer before I was in politics, right? And so we have really... Uh, it was a great profession, but there were always some bad apples, some people who were dodgy, they would try to take advantage of clients. And so the way to deal with that is to be really firm, to be ethical uh, and to make sure that you have the structures there to pick them up. That's why I say, for politics, for example, you want to have a National Integrity Commission. You want to have... Like, people in the public need to be confident that the Prime Minister of the day will uphold the ministerial standards really, really rigorously, not try to find ways to avoid mm. them applying. But surely on a personal level, you're just like, can you just pull your head in? Because you're making yeah, us all course. look bad. It's I mean, and you've seen that. I say in the book that it, always, it was always shocked me that despite the fact that my colleagues knew that you weren't supposed to leak from the party room, they would literally sit in the party... Well, some people, some people, I should say, would sit in the party room and during the meeting text what was happening to journalists knowing that it was completely verboten. Who did that? 
Well, I don't know. I wouldn't say their <laughs> names. But it had to happen because Sky was reporting things that were going on in the party room while we were still in the room. And people used to hold up their phones and say, Sky's just reported what such and such said. And I used to think, how could they be so blatant and brazen? What it's advantage is there in that, though? I don't know. They obviously wanted to undermine whoever the leader was at the time, I suppose. And that's the reason for my book. My book isn't about salacious, you know, lies and stuff. It's because that 12 years that I was in the leadership group um, from 2007 to 2019 was a really crazy period in Australian politics. We saw what, half a dozen prime ministers mm. after the stability of the Howard period, which was 11 and a half years, and I thought that sort of needed to be explained from my perspective. All right. Our next question tonight is from Marika Contellis. Yeah, thanks. The Prime Minister, speaking of Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison has warned Australia needs to prepare for a post-COVID world, world that's poorer and it's more dangerous and more disorderly. Do you think that's true? Um, what dangers is the Prime Minister talking about and uh, where is it going to be more disorderly? Putting Scott Morrison's warning in the context of the recent defence spending announcement, I'm getting the feeling that the Prime Minister is preparing us for war. I hope you can tell me I'm wrong. Terry Butler. Well, look, those were very uh, confronting words, I think, from the Prime Minister. And I think at the moment when we're facing some pretty spectacularly diff difficult problems, I mean, of course, um, there is... Uh, a lot of change in the region and in, in the world. The, the power dynamics are shifting uh, between nations. Uh, we've got the United States, which I think a lot of countries would like to see once again return to playing a bit more of an active and consistent role in world affairs. Uh, we've got uh, different countries rising in terms of their power and um, their wealth. All of those things, I think, um, are important. At the same time, we've also got this global pandemic, which is creating incredible anxiety across the world. And of course, there's always the spectre of climate change. I don't know if that's what Scott Morrison is referring to, but it's certainly on my mind in terms of major risks uh, facing the planet. So with all of those risks and uncertainties arising, I think it, there, there could be a temptation for people to uh, slip into pessimism and despondency about our future. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think that um, the best approach is to maintain... I've got a friend who used to uh, be a, a... He was involved in the UN um, as a, a peace negotiator in Cambodia, and he used to say to me, you want to adopt strategic optimism, as in not be a Pollyanna about things, but actually, as a strategic posture, believe that things can be better. And I think we have to have some strategic optimism in the face of all these uncertainties, that that's really important. The Prime Minister, though, compared this point in time to the 1930s and 40s. He said, we've not seen the conflation of global economic and strategic uncertainty now being experienced in our region since the existential threat we faced when the global and regional order collapsed back then. Christopher Pine, is that overdoing it somewhat? No, I think he's saying that in the 1930s we had the Great Depression and then we had the militarisation throughout the 30s of places like Germany and Japan. And our response then was to focus on the economy and to try and get us out of the depression. So what's he comparing to the rise of Nazism? Uh, the uncertainty... Well, I think there's two things about the 30s. One is the economic aspect of it, the Great Depression, which is now the pandemic that we have, which is obviously smashing the economy. And two, when that happens, in the 30s, the Australian government decided to focus on the economy and reduced our spending to 1.5% of GDP in defence. And we are not going to do that because we face a very unstable uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. I mean, there's just no getting away from it. And that statement they made last week, the force posture plan, the force structure plan and the um, defence update, uh, the difference between 2016 when the white paper was delivered when I was in the portfolio on today is the, uh, the acknowledgement that... Five years ago, we were more stable than we are today. Uh, there are more disputes than there were then. There's less international cohesion than there was then. And the rivalry between the United States, which, which could have gone uh, in a positive direction, has not gone in a positive direction. It's in a negative direction and it's very raw as opposed to Pacific. Did you underestimate the amount of change that was going to occur under a Trump administration in the United States and what that would do no, I don't for Australia think so. strategically? No, I think uh, everybody, when President Trump got elected, wanted him to do, wanted him to succeed. I think they hoped that the uh, 
division and discord that is his uh, political stock in trade uh, in order to win the election was a campaigning tool and that that would give way to sensible, calm government. Uh, and we've all been disappointed that that hasn't been the case. OK. Our next question tonight is a video from Jenny Gamble in Holland Park, Queensland. While still Defence Minister, Christopher Pine met with EY Defence to discuss his post-political career. Nine days after leaving politics, he joined EY as a consultant. How is this ethical? And why does Christopher Pine think that this meets community standards for appropriate behaviour? So you didn't breach ministerial rules in this role, but this is a question about the ethics of it. How, how is it ethical to walk out of politics into a job that's so clearly linked to the, to the ministerial position you had? Well, Jenny Gamble's not right. Um, I mean, I met with uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of people as the Minister for Defence over many months and Def Minister for Defence Industry. I didn't discuss with EY the idea of working for them at all uh, when I was the Minister for Defence. And um, uh, I'm not, I actually not a consultant at EY, which is one of these great media misnomers what, 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 what which has been do? created. <laughs> EY is a client of my firm. I'm not a consultant at EY, but you know, I, rather than bother to explain that when nobody wanted to hear it, um, a year ago I you, just you let consult, that go. You consult for them, though. Well, I'm, uh, and you're, so what? You're a you consultant. Know, no, no, I'm just yeah. saying you are a consultant. Well, there are clients. The confusion might have come from. And uh, there was a Senate inquiry into this, which found absolutely no wrongdoing on my part, none but, whatsoever. But it's a que but her question is about ethics, not whether you breach the rules. It's well, about Jenny ethics. Gamble's view of what I did, she doesn't like it. That's fine. She's, it's a democracy. She's perfectly entitled to be uh, to have her view. The, my view is there's a ministerial code of conduct. It has two arms. Uh, one of those arms is that I'm not allowed to lobby anybody in the Department of Defence, the Minister for Defence, their officers for, tw for 18 months after I retire, uh, and I have completely complied with that. Mm. And I'm not allowed to use uh, information that became available to me as the Minister for Defence for commercial gain, and I've entirely uh, abided by that, and the Senate inquiry mm. found that. Mm. But EY's press release said that it was ramping up its defence capability ahead of this surge in activity, uh, that it wanted to be able to uh, be involved in the $200 billion spend over two, two, 10 years, and we've engaged Christopher Pine to assist with this. So what, what do you help them with? Uh, well, the thing about being a politician for 26 years and being a minister for um, six plus Minister for Ageing in the Howard Government, is that you actually get a pretty good idea of how government works, uh, whether it's defence uh, or any other part of government. And uh, it's that knowledge of the way government thinks that anybody, when they leave politics, would find it useful for firms in business. There's nothing unethical about doing that. And you can't actually, when you stop being a member of parliament, um, sort of expunge your experience of the last 26 years, and nor would you want to, because it's actually quite a valuable uh, capability mm. in the economy, is knowing how government works and mm. using those skills. But Terry Butler, you talked about the importance of trust in politics and politicians. It's not, this is not something that just happens on one side of politics. Mike Kelly, who's just left in Eden Monero, said he was leaving due to ill health and then walked into another job with... A military contractor, or although a we've been in opposition for seven years, it's not as though he was in government and then walked out into a defence job. No, he didn't mention anything about it when he said he was leaving and there was going to be a by-election. No, and only... you would also be aware that he's had significant health problems and that mm. that was what motivated him. And look, Parliament is, you know, it's pretty rough on the old Constitution, mm. Parliament. Let's be honest. But, but um, do you see why this sort of thing oh, no, does diminish but the trust? But to answer your that actual question, about? and look, um, the Senate inquiry that Christopher is talking about was really critical of the way that the government had investigated um, both Christopher's issue and also um, former Minister Julie Bishop's post-government employment as well. It said, look, you didn't take it seriously enough. The, invest the investigation, so-called, was really just a phone call to each of Julie Bishop and Christopher Pine. There wasn't enough investigating with the firms that they were going to do go and do work for. And, yes, I do think that that undermines trust. I do think it does. And, you know, I, I don't want to talk about Christopher's particular case or any particular case. I think that it's incumbent on all of us to think about 
um, community standards, at the same time it's incumbent on the community to decide what they want from politicians. Mm. They want ethical behaviour, uh, they want us for there not to be a revolving door between government and, and the private sector in ways that give rise to conflicts of interest. Uh, but they also don't want to give ex-politicians a pension for life. So you're either going to have one of three things happen. Either people are going to stick around way past their, their sell-by date, or you're going to have to give them a pension, or they're going to have to get a job. And if they're going to have to get a job, then the rules need to be very clear as well. Do you think it's ethical, Brooke? I think it's really difficult and I think it's you know difficult at the best of times to attract really excellent candidates into these jobs where they could go into other roles and be paid a lot more, be criticised a lot less and spend more time with their families. And so I do think that there needs to be very clear rules around what can and can't happen when people leave. But I also know from my time in Canberra that they work incredibly hard and that they're really difficult and thankless jobs. And so I, I do, I feel bad for, for Polly sometimes because you feel like they get beat up on this side and then beat up on that side. I, I, you know, I think I'm getting a little bit off topic there and I do think that there, do, there does need to be clear lines and, and clear, um, clear rules about it. Um, but I also think that if people want a higher standard from their politicians, then they can demand it, you know, be more engaged in, in the process and, and ask more of them because, you know, they're working for us. OK. Our next question tonight is a video from Scott McClarty in Adelaide. Satirical platforms like Matters Help and The Batuta Advocate are booming in popularity. But on a more serious level, their reporting seems to be more accurate to what everyday people are thinking. <laughs> Examples are Sean listing all the things Stuart Robert has stuffed up in his time as MP. <laughs> or The Batuta Advocate suggesting the sports bet app was euthanised behind a green fence when it failed on Melbourne Cup Day. They're accurate, funny, cutting and truly depressing. My question is, how have we got here? Is it life imitating art? And do those targeted really care? Sean, we're running way over time, so if you sure. can keep it brief, please. Um, I don't, look, I, that's, it's very flattering to be thought of in, in those terms, but uh, um, I only know what I read in the newspaper and see on programs like this. So um, I don't have any special insight. Um, all we try and do is present as much information as possible in as few words to set up the joke essentially and uh, it was very easy with Stuart Robert I think we just uh, we did a cut and paste from the newspaper and just read it out <laughs> do you miss do you miss Christopher Pyatt <laughs> um, oh well you, you know the, the thing is and I and I hope this is uh, felt from uh, Terry and Christopher is that there's never anything personal I mean I don't know exactly. Terry and Christopher there's never anything personal in the show and and to us uh, you guys are uh, very entertaining public figures <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is that I'm not as entertaining as him. I never take anything no, personally. No, no, I no. think that's a bit of a problem, actually. Well, <laughs> <laughs> come on, you said in your book mm -hmm. that you took it personally What's when Julia Gillard again? went for you. you. You took that very personally. Mm. Uh, no, I just determined that I was going to make her pay for it at some point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Slightly different. Oh. So I took the building the education revolution apart to the point where she didn't even mention it in her re-election speech, which I thought was quite a success because it was $16.5 billion. And every school in my electorate has a new library and they love them. Mm, they great. love them, Christopher. Well, why didn't she mention it in her election? They love yeah, them. Right. It's a shame. Brooke, yeah. final word to you. Um, what are we talking about? Batuta and Matters Hell, that's right. Um, I think that it's really difficult to see um, mainstream media always blamed for not delivering news content to people that they want. You know, we get sort of minute-by-minute minute breakdowns. We get ratings. We deliver the sort of content that people demand. And so if you want um, more excellent content, then vote with your feet, buy newspapers and, you know, watch the shows that appeal to you and then there'll be more of them made. You know, this isn't some sort of secret ploy to... Um, you know, for news quality to suffer or something like that. You know, people get what they want. OK. That's all we've got time for tonight. A huge thanks to our panel, Sean McAuliffe, Terry Butler, Christopher Pine, don't say the name of your book, and Brooke <laughs> Boney. Would you please thank them all? Thank you. Uh, thanks as well to those of you here in the studio. It's great to have some of you back. Thanks to you at home for sending in your questions. Next week on Q&A, a special, a one-on-one -on -one with our former Prime Minister, Julia Gillard. Don't miss it. Good night.